All right. What's up, nerds? Yeah. So I'd like to know, uh, did you come here because you play Minecraft? Raise your hand. And then, and then keep your hand up, please. Alternatively, did you come here because you have important customers who play Minecraft? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm both. Um, I have some kids who are uh, massively obsessed with Minecraft, and then I also like to play it. And for me, it's a resource management game. I collect all the resources, and my children consume them um, on the game. And then I also use it as a three-dimensional programming model, so I get to automate things, and that's super dope. Um, so if you do uh, Minecraft, that's great. How many of you came here because you have to manage commercial off-the-shelf software that's provided to you by others with strange constraints you don't always know, right? Cool, good. Everyone's going to be happy. Um, there's going to be a lot more of the Kubernetes than the Minecraft. I hope that's all right. Okay. This is my first talk in, in, in an actual conference in more than two years for uh, undisclosed reasons. Um, but I'm pretty excited. Uh, you can reach out to me. I'm at Casey West everywhere. I recently um, bought the Instagram handle from the other person. Um, you know, and if you do go and follow me, uh, you're probably going to see like hiking and rock climbing and stuff more than computery nerd stuff. But if you're into that, that's where I'm at. Let's start with the Minecraft architecture diagram. So those of you who run a Minecraft server know that this is the architecture diagram. You've got a client on the left there. That's your computer. Uh, and if you're running a server uh, that's separate from that computer, then you run server.jar and uh, you connect to it. Right? Um, obviously, uh, the title of this talk is Enterprise Grade Minecraft on Kubernetes. And so I got to, to thinking, you know, is it possible to run this server on Kubernetes in a way that's resilient. And we can also do things like you know, data backup so that if we, if we need to recover the world from a previous snapshot, we could do something like that. And it turns out you can. So uh, I work for a cloud company, so my, my Kubernetes live in, in one place. You, yours can live wherever they want. It doesn't matter. This isn't a, a, a specific talk in any way. Um, but this is roughly what the architecture is going to look like. You know? you, so you've got your client there on the left. Uh, there's going to be a load balancer just in front of an instance, uh, so that's fun, uh, an instance of this server. If you're uh, running commercial grade software that's provided to you by others, the one that I love uh, for work is like S4 HANA from SAP. Incredible, massive database, super f performant, and uh, there are a couple of different ways to scale it, but you know, one of them is get the biggest computer you can find, right? Um, and that's kind of like Minecraft. Uh, so, Another thing about this piece of software is that you can do modifications, right? So you can install modifications on the server, uh, and, and that's pretty fun. Um, how many of you play or know about modded Minecraft? Yes, we, we really do have a room full of nerds. This is great. Yeah, so, you know, I like, you know, fabric and some vanilla tweaks data packs and things like that, and I figure I shouldn't uh, just go and, you know, curl them from the web. I should do that, but then put them in a storage solution that I control, right? And that I can also do things like version control. Uh, and then I can get them into my, into my Minecraft instance. Um, so that's one thing we're going to do with customizations. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the other big thing is backups, right? So how do we do backups? Well, I'm going to choose to, to do uh, storage, like super cold, like um, uh, version controlled storage. It's, pretty inexpensive, and I can always pull out a version uh, from the past, and I can configure that however I want. So, so that's kind of the plan, but it's a little bit, there are a couple of other little things to point out. One of them is, you know, being able to consistently know the address of your Minecraft server is handy, so we need like a static IP, we can throw DNS in front of that, we could do, you know, a solution like that. Um, there's also, uh, you know, the server is running, and we might need to run remote commands against that server, right? This is something that happens a lot with commercial software that's given to us, is, is that, you know, usually we're required to log into the machine it's running on or the, the, the VM it's running on and do stuff, right? And we, we don't really want to do that for obvious reasons, I think, for, for probably most of us in the, in the Kubernetes world. In a containerized landscape, we don't want to be logging on and messing around. 
So we need some sort of remote admin. Thankfully, in the gaming world, Valve released an open protocol called Archon, which lets you do remote control of, uh, of your game server. And it's been baked into Minecraft. Go Minecraft devs. I also want to use a mod called Voice Chat, because I play with my children, and uh, you know it's really fun for them to uh, bark orders at me to collect certain types of resources for them so that they can use them in the build. Um, and we do that through voice chat. Um, so we're going to install that as a client. And of course, that, that requires a service and a protocol so that our clients can interact with the, the server-side voice chat system. And then uh, for backups, we're going to use a good old cron, but we're going to do it the Kubernetes way. So you know, that's going to be the fun. And I have, let's see, about a maximum of 30 minutes to get into it. Um, so just to... Uh, Give you a heads up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and create a cluster. Forget the thing on the left. That's a typo. Um, that'll come in later. But a thing that is handy to know, uh, if you don't know about ARM machine types, it doesn't really matter. But this is a high memory, high CPU machine type. So I'm just going to create a uh, node pool with one instance, because I'm running one Minecraft server. Um, and I can only one, run one instance of that server. Um, and we'll get into uh, why in a moment. And uh, this is roughly the configuration that I'm going to use for that. And I'm just going to set a few other things to try and keep my Kubernetes cluster up to date and in good shape. So let's start with state management. Um, there are some requirements for this particular piece of commercial off-the-shelf software. Um, I didn't write them down because I'm a bad product manager. Um, but I am an all right engineer. So you know, it worked out for me. But, um, one of the requirements of Minecraft, one of the things to know about this application is that it keeps its state on disk. So when you create a new world, a new world is a bunch of files on disk in a, in a directory. Furthermore, uh, you can configure your Minecraft server. You can set a bunch of parameters, like am I playing in creative mode or survival? Am, am I playing on hard mode? Who's allowed to connect to this server? What is my whitelist of those individuals who can be an operator? Right? These sorts of things that that are important to know. And um, the devs for Minecraft have decided that the, the way to do that is on disk, right? So that's also on disk. All of this is inside of a data directory. So we obviously need to keep that data directory. Um, we have to manage that as state. Uh, we don't want it to disappear if our, if our game crashes, right? If our pod uh, disappears, we don't want our actual world to disappear. That makes the children literally cry. Um, so we don't want to do that. So for state management, and you know, there's a lot of CRDs in here, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go through every every line. I'm going to assume that we can all Google this, or or maybe even know what all of these things are. But I'm just gonna highlight a couple of things as we walk through what the configuration looks like and why I chose the things I did. Um, so. One of the things that, that I want to do is I want to use a fast disk. So Minecraft is going to work better if your disk is fast. It's going to perform a little better. It's also going to perform if you have more CPU and memory, or the most you can have, right? So um, up to a point, because Java. But, uh, but it's going to perform pretty well if you have a lot of resources. And so I'm going to use solid state disks. And in order to do that, I just need to set up a storage class first. I'm going to call it fast disk here. Um, and there are a couple of things I'm going to do. Um, the thing I want to point out is the reclaim policy here, which is to retain. So if something happens where um, this gets uh, yeeted from your Kubernetes um, uh, state uh, for your cluster, uh, we can retain this, the actual disk underneath. So, and the other thing is, of course, volume expansion. And you're going to see right now that I'm going to start with about 50 gigs of data. That's a pretty sizable world. Um, but if you play the game for a while, you know that you can, you can outpace that 50 gigs pretty easily. And, and you want to be able to, to expand that, but you don't want to have to pay for and over-provision you know, 300 or 500 gigs or something like that. So um, that's one of the things we're going to do. The other thing we're going to do is set this access mode. Um, so like a lot of, again, commercial off-the-shelf software, off software that wasn't designed to work in a Kubernetes world and sort of scale in a, in a cloud-first uh, manner, uh, this application runs one instance against one set of data, right? So you can't run multiple instances against the same set of data. Um, we would run into all of the classic problems that we're familiar with from the last 30 or 40 years with disk-based state and multiple instances of our applications, like 
file locking and reading and writing is, is an issue. So we want to avoid all that issue, and we're just going to say read, write, once pod. So um, only one pod can have access to read or write on our cluster to this disk. Right? That's one of the, the key things here. And of course, we're specifying that we're going to use the fast, fast disk storage class. Um, so that allows us uh, to get away with having our solid state disk. Um, and we also happen to have a secret, and the secret is actually for that Archon tool. So I mentioned that we're going to create, or we're going to set up the protocol for doing remote management of this uh, application, and we're using the Archon protocol. Again, Valve open sourced the the protocol, and it's an open standard. Um, and we need a, a secret password to to connect to it. Um, so it this is not a secure password. I don't recommend you using it. It isn't my real password. Um, yeah, use it if you want. Actually, it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> All right, application deployment. So let's get into this a little bit. Um, this is actually, good. this is of course going to be a bit longer. Um, so one of the things here is our recreate strategy. So by default, um, many of us may know that when we go to update uh, a deployment, it's going to do a rolling deploy, or it's going to attempt to do a rolling deploy. That's not going to work out so well for us if we have multiple things trying to access this state on disk, right? So instead of that, in this particular case, we have to deal with the, the downtime and, and just recreate the pod. So we're going to shut down the old one, terminate it, and we're going to start up another one. Um, super important for our state here. Um, here's a little bit more of the deployment under the specification here. So for our container, I'm actually uh, standing on the shoulders of giants. This user here, who's, that's also his username on, on GitHub, um, created a Minecraft server Docker container for us, which is really handy. And I'm going to pretend that you know, in the world of enterprise-grade work, this person is on my team and uh, built me a, a kick-in Docker container. Uh, and in fact, that is what happened. So we've got a great image to work from. Um, and uh, we're going to start from there. And I'm using latest, which is, uh, should be a red flag for all of you, totally not enterprise grade. Send your pull requests. Um, but hopefully everybody knows. Yeah, I saw a lot of head nods. We should, we should pick our versions. OK, cool. Yep. So uh, then we're going to request some resources. So in this case, I'm going to request as much CPU as I can get and about five gigs of memory. And this particular machine type class, I think, has six gigs of memory. So I'm leaving a little bit of room for the overhead, but basically consuming it all with this application. And I already know, you know, because I've, I've designed this solution, that I'm going to run one instance on one machine, right? One node will run one pod. And that's it. And in fact, because again, the way that Minecraft works, it's, it's going to be a noisy neighbor. It's going to um, consume and, and aggressively use the resources that you try and offer it. I wouldn't necessarily want to run more than one on a node. Um, you know, your mileage may vary, but I would probably choose uh, one per node going forward. And then I'm going to set up these volume mounts. So I mentioned state is managed on disk. Um, in this container image configuration, that state is at slash data from root. So we're going to mount our uh, fast disk, our persistent volume claim, um, into that location. So that's going to be how we, how we keep our state uh, inside of this pod. So that's a state, our stateful container. Um, the dev that built our image uh, provided through environment variables a bunch of ways to configure the server. I mentioned that we have all kinds of configuration settings that we can use. Um, you can see here, and this is actually pretty important for Minecraft, if you want to tune its actual execution, is to su supply a bunch of um, JVM arguments. I've, I've uh, for the sake of this slide and just space, I've cut out a bunch of what's actually in my configuration. Um, and I would, you know, that's something you can Google for yourself if, if you haven't uh, when it comes to running Java version of, of Minecraft. But um, you can see I'm going to set the memory at four gigs. Now, this is interesting because I've provisioned five gigs for the, or I've requested five gigs for the pod, and I'm using four. I'm giving myself a little bit of headroom here um, just in case because uh, I really want things to run smoothly. Um, I accept the end user license agreement. I'm enabling Archon, and I'm uh, also um, setting the password through this environment state as well from a secret, right? So um, we set up that secret earlier. 
Cool. Okay. So our server um, uh, exposes multiple protocols on multiple ports, uh, or multiple services, I should say, um, network services on multiple ports, and using a couple of different protocols. So we need to uh, expose those as well. So this is something that I've learned to appreciate um, about Kubernetes in general. Um, I come from a more like platform, higher abstraction, like application development world. And of course, in that world, like a lot of your apps, like they're connecting over one protocol or you're using them over one protocol. You're only, you only have one port. Like you can, you can have a whole bunch of constraints and everything is fine. But I didn't write this software and it was given to me and I got to run it and I need more flexibility than that, right? So I already have to do custom things with disk and state. I have to do custom things with ports. I can do that with Kubernetes. It's really not, not that big of a deal, right? It's designed to allow for that, and that's why I think we can get away with this, uh, doing stateful and COT solutions on, on Kubernetes in a pretty, pretty easy to, to manage way. So we've got voice chat, that's UDP, we've got Archon, we've got Minecraft itself. These ports are all uh, default from, uh, from the configuration of the software directly. And then uh, finally, I'm gonna set up some probes, right? So I wanna know when the server is ready, um, I also want to know if it's alive, so we're just going to do some probes to check that sort of thing. Um, doesn't hurt to do it. It's a, it's a decent idea. And this is where I had some fun. So how do I get my mods on disk, right? How do I get my mods into the server instance before it spins up so that it knows that it has mods? And this is a solution that I came up with, is, is using... Uh, initialization containers, and this is pretty, pretty dope. And you can actually have an array of them, so I just have one here, but you can do another dash args down below, and you can have a whole list, and they run in order. And, and so that's pretty neat, because then you can separate them out. So this is the one to install voice chat, and I've got one for Fabric, and one for the Vanilla Tweaks data pack, and, and so on and so forth. But you can see here that I am storing uh, the mods as jars in a bucket that I can access and I can pull from. Um, and I'm just using curl, I'm using the curl image here um, for this initialization container. So I don't have to initialize using the Minecraft container. Um, all I have to do is make sure I mount the data directory and I make it readable, or writable rather. Right? So as long as I do that, I can actually write the state into it and I do that before the game ever starts up. And that's how I can get my mods in there. Now, it does this every single time I restart the server. But I don't restart the server that often, and it's pretty fast, and I think, I think that's okay. And I could optimize this with additional um, checks to like bail out early, to you know, freshness or whatever, but, um, but it's good enough. Cool, so initializing containers, pretty neat. All right, now uh, service availability. So, we obviously have the Minecraft service itself. So if I have a client and I want to connect to the server, I'd have to connect to some IP address, or if I set up DNS, it would be DNS. Um, we also have the voice chat, which connects through the client as well, if the client has that plugin enabled, or, or that mod. And we have the Archon um, remote control uh, API. So we have to set up these services. So the first thing that I need to do is, is have an IP address. Um, this is how I get my IP address. Um, and how I make it static. Uh, you can do it however you like. Uh, it's worth noting that uh, by default, this first command gives you an IPv4. Um, I actually don't know if Minecraft can speak over or if, like the client knows IPv6. I see some nods. I see some maybes. So, you know, I stuck with IPv4. Um, you could also do a global IP, but all of my uh, users are within the United States, and I feel like it's not so bad if it's all in uh, from one zone. So I just stuck with that. And then of course, if you do describe, that'll essentially tell you what the IP address is. So we have three services. So the first one is, is Minecraft. This is relatively straightforward. Um, we're gonna set up the load balancer, give it the IP address that we have that's static. And in this case, I set external traffic policy to cluster. I set it to cluster because um, I didn't mind the hop. I think we could do local, um, and honestly, I didn't check it. So you could do local or cluster. Um, that's up to you. Um, but it is nice to have the load balancer in there. Um, so I like, to, uh, I like to have it. And we're going to do the same for Archon here. Um, it's again, it's TCP. Um, same IP address. 
Um, we're going to do the load balancer. And finally, uh, voice chat. So for voice chat, it's UDP, um, which of course we can do uh, through the load balancer, so no big deal. And same IP address. That's services. So now we've got the services exposed. But here's the, here's the big one, right? So how do we do backup? And I found this personally like really a little overly complex for my taste. Um, and for those of you who have had to deal with like identity management and uh, access to external services and having access to manipulate um, Kubernetes through the API, you, you maybe have already had to deal with this. And, and I'm sure that there are many people in this audience right now who are more expert than me. Um, so I'm just going to walk you through what I did. But basically what I wanted to do is every, uh, is about twice a day, I just wanted to take a snapshot, right? Take a snapshot, throw it into a storage bucket. It's versioned, and I keep a certain number of versions. I think I chose to keep five, so that's about two and a half days of, of play. So essentially if, like, one of my children, you know, TNT griefs the heck out of one of my other kids' builds, I, I have two and a half days to, like, make it right, right? So that's, you know, my, that's my concern there. So the first thing I had to do is create a service account, um, you know, just a backup runner. And then I had to create a role um, to interact with Kubernetes, right? So the Kubernetes API. So essentially, I need to be able to get information out of this pod. The data is in the pod. The pod gets this generated, you know, name with a SHA, and I need to be able to access it um, in order to run some commands. And you'll see why in a second. And then I have to bind this role. Um, th these are all pretty straightforward. There's no like sort of fancy thing here, no, no magic necessarily. But then, because I want to store this on uh, cloud storage in my uh, you know, infrastructure provider of choice, I have to manage that as well. So I have to create an, uh, an uh, IAM service account uh, to interact with my service or my uh, infrastructure provider. And then I have to um, add that uh, service account to a policy that can manage storage objects. So that's this right here, like be a storage admin. Let me do stuff with storage and do it in my project. All righty. So now we're at this policy, which allows you know, Kubernetes workload to, do, to, to have an identity, right? So we're going to run a cron job on Kubernetes, and that's going to initialize a pod. That pod's going to... Um, log on to this other pod, get the data out of it, and put it into the, the uh, GCS object, or Google Cloud Storage uh, object. And in order to do that, um, we have to be some, some identity, right? This, this application has to, has to take on an identity, and I wanted to take on the service account for uh, GCP in this case. So that's a workload identity user here, and I'm setting this member um, the Minecraft backup runner essay. So essentially, it can, it can be this other service account. Which leads us to the cron job, which I was relatively new to when I first set this up. I set this up initially about a year ago, I think. Um, but I was initially new to it and, it, and this is super cool. So it's just like cron jobs of old. Um, you say you want to run it uh, twice a day. I'm going to say specifically, like, I do not want to run this concurrently, right? So. I just only want to ever run one instance of this thing at a time, so I can, uh, if, I, if my world was massive and, or I was taking snapshots very frequently, I wouldn't have these things running over one another. And this is, a, uh, this is what, what the cron job looks like. So I'm going to run an, uh, a pod, uh, and the container that I'm going to pull, the image I'm going to pull, is the cloud SDK, because I need some tools to interact with my infrastructure provider. And it turns out, you know, I can just get this super lightweight cloud SDK. It's running Alpine, or it's on Alpine. And then um, I'm going to install these uh, components on G Cloud, because I get G Cloud from the cloud SDK. Um, so I can get uh, my Kubernetes uh, API interaction, and I can get my uh, storage object management. Um, so I'm going to get my pod ID using this gnarly thing here. And once I have that, I can start executing commands. Now, um, I'm running in the cluster, so uh, I'm using the Archon CLI. So I mentioned already that this is a remote control API that you can use to, to manage the server remotely. Um, you can also use 
the CLI, just like you'd you know, use the, the uh, uh, Kubernetes API, uh, controller API directly, or you'd use the command line. And so I'm going to turn off saving in the game, and then I'm going to save everything that's currently in memory, right? Get our snapshot. Um, snapshot it. Turn saving back on. So there's a little blip here where you know, maybe something would glitch out and we would actually uh, lose some state if people were playing while it was happening. I haven't seen that happen, but it could happen. You know, it's, it's a race. Um, and then we're going to use GSUtil to uh, copy that new uh, snapshot into the bucket. And again, this bucket is just cold, like, uh, archive storage that, uh, that gets versioned. And um, so old versions just go away automatically. It costs me a little bit extra um, in, you know, because I'm using a, a cloudy provider here. It costs me a little extra to yank it back out, but it's really, really, really cheap to put it in. So that's nice. And then if it happens to fail, then we'll, we'll restart. We'll just try again. And that's, you know, that's backups. So that's not too bad. Um, this is what the backup uh, configuration roughly looks like. This is the important bits uh, that you would need to know. Um, again, I think you can do this on any provider that provides this kind of uh, storage solution. It's not, it's not unique. Um, but the idea is you know, turn on versioning, and you can set retention policy to be a certain number of days or a certain number of revisions. Right? So you can do that sort of thing. All right, so does it run? <laughs> All right. So uh, if I start the client, which I, I just took snapshots, I just took pictures to, to be super safe. But if I start the client, you know, I would see you know, my Minecraft server running on Kubernetes. I've said that a maximum of four players can play because I've only whitelisted four players. Um, that's how many I have. Um, and nobody was on when I took the snapshot. Uh, and then when I logged in last, uh, I had nothing, and I was in a cave. But you know, it's, uh, it, it did run. And just for the heck of it, um, we can try. Do, do, do. And I last uh, deployed this uh, last night because, you know, conference talks. So it should still be up. <laughs> and we will find out. So if I go to multiplayer, family server, I should still be stuck in a scary, scary cave. Yeah. There I am. All right. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. And, and you can see that we have our internet connectivity here, so that's cool. Um, those, uh, those bars like your mobile phone uh, indicate how good uh, your latency is, and we're not doing too bad. So that's pretty cool. By the way, um, <laughs> I, I was here uh, earlier than most because I was prepping to give this talk, and um, it felt like we should have music. And I don't know how many of you know this, but if you do play Minecraft, and if some of your constituents are, are small or fun, um, there's a uh, parody of uh, Katy Perry's Last Friday Night on, I know it's on Spotify because that's what I use, but it's called Don't Mind at Night. Uh, and it is very funny. Um, it's like, uh, I know you're feeling kind of brave. Or I know you're looking at that cave and you're feeling kind of brave. You know, don't mind at night. It's, it's pretty good. So highly recommended. Uh, it's a bop. All right, so what if you want to do this for yourself, but you don't want to uh, go find my slides on Schedge and... Uh, and you know, piece this together yourself by hand. Turns out the same person who wrote uh, the, the awesome, or put together the awesome image for Minecraft, also put together the server charts uh, and threw it on GitHub. And that's actually what I do use to manage my instances. And they are great. And he has, in fact, also done like the backup management and all that stuff for you. So if you want specifically to run Minecraft and do it in a decent way, this is a pretty cool way to do it, I think. Um, and it works on, um, you know, on Kubernetes. It's, it's not um, 
provider specific, uh, but it, he does have some uh, notes here and there if you're using a particular provider. And then I did a couple of things uh, custom, most notably like the uh, storage class for persistent disks because it's a certain configuration that works with with my chosen uh, infrastructure location. So, um, so that's pretty cool. And hopefully through this, uh, my goal was to explain some of the things that Kubernetes has on hand that I use uh, to run an off-the-shelf piece of software that I also recommend uh, when I talk to big companies and, and people who are trying to figure out how to containerize their stuff. You know, when it comes to off-the-shelf software, the first question is, like, are you really sure that's what you need to do? Um, and if they are really, really sure that's what they need to do, um, a lot of these uh, tips and tricks are quite useful for a lot of solutions that you have to manage that could go into a Kubernetes cluster but need a little finessing of the configuration. Um, we've got options for you. So um, hopefully you can take these and run with them. Um, there's uh, four minutes if there's a question or two. Yep. So have you thought about using a job template to be able to restore the data? Yeah, so question is, have I thought about using a job template to restore the data? Totally. Uh, yes, that is a good idea. However, uh, I didn't write anything to do data restore because that's how good of an engineer I am. <laughs> no, just because... Um, uh, I, I honestly was like, I can solve that problem if I have it. I, at least I have the backups, the snapshots, I trust them. Um, and I believe that, uh, I know that my customer would alert me to an issue with this application <laughs> immediately, and I would have time to fix it. That's my circumstances, may not be everybody's. That's a good question. Uh, one last question. Oh, we have a question right here. Yep, go for it. Totally. Um, this, configure, this cluster configuration, I think, uh, on my infrastructure provider is about $106 a month. Yeah. Now, uh, Minecraft is really important to my family. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, no doubt. Uh, you don't have to run um, a 4 gig server instance. And again, like getting nerdy about Minecraft specifically for a moment, there are a lot of mods that hyper optimize both memory and CPU consumption. There's also mods that optimize network uh, traffic. And you can get a really high quality experience um, with reduced uh, resource uh, claims. Um, so you could probably, I think, for four players, like you could probably cut that in half and be happy for a while. Um, but it's not free. That's a good point. Is this running 24/7? Is there a way you can sort of optimize yeah. this so that it only runs? Totally awesome question. So the question is: this, Is this running 24/7, or can you optimize it? Uh, I do not run it 24/7 um, because sometimes my children get grounded. Um, <laughs> Which is basically the same as, hey, you know, maybe you only need this during business hours, like, you know, in in one uh, one time zone. Um, yeah, you can you can shut this down. So I shut it down just by um, I'm I'm super. I don't have it automated. I just go and and run um, uh, replicas to zero uh, scale, right? So I just say run zero replicas or run one run one replica. And when it, when I run one, because I have the persistent volume claim and it's and it is persistent, uh, it just pulls the world back up and everything is good to go. Yeah, that is uh, an excellent question. Yeah, so in this particular case, it's it's pretty easy, and you could throw that into a cron job if you wanted to. You know, um, another good question. Uh, yeah. All right, last one. Um, yeah. So the backups still attend, still try and they fail. Yeah, that's a good question too. Yeah. So they fail because they can't get the pod ID, and then and then there's an error. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, that's a good question. All right, I really appreciate it, everybody. Uh, it's a long walk back to whatever talk you're going to next. So thank you very much for coming down here.